Okay. Okay. You need to send the instructions to how to set that up. Okay. To do it for you, but I have not received the instructions yet. And That's okay. The video is a new world, but I was glad to hear that you can do it with your iPad and make it real simple. That that and then you can just take it up to him and It's back on. All right, so let's look in John chapter 11, verse 52. Got to get all the buddies working I do if I talk. <laughs> oh, that's it. Okay, John chapter 11 and verse 51. All right, John eleven fifty one. And this spoke he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus, Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that are scattered abroad. And from that day forth, he took counsel together to put him to death. All right, here we see prophecy used in a negative. You remember Herod wanted to to get the prophets together to find out about Jesus from that very passage in Micah 5.2, didn't he? Uh, he he um, He wanted to have pointed out to him where the Messiah, the king, was to come in. And he had his own reasons for that. So, as we continue with this idea of prophecy, okay, um, it is, uh, prophecy is not necessarily or even primarily forthtelling. It's the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means. Uh, This is an example of it here. Um, whether with reference to the past, the present, or the future, which we've already looked at in our three examples prior. So um, let's look in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And I know that this book, part of Corinthians, this part of Corinthians gets misused as well. Um, Always remember that when you're looking at a passage or a reference in Scripture, you have to remember where you are and what the context of that is. Um, I would hate to see anybody acclaim spirituality to gifts and be using 1 Corinthians uh, as their basis because (laughs) this was a carnal church. And this is corrective. And we know they are, Paul said, you're carnal and walk as men. So this is corrective, and they were misusing the gifts. So happens. So look in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, 28. And God hath set forth some in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of languages. Now, I like this next passage. It's questions, and they're rhetorical questions, Mm -hmm. of which the obvious answer is no. Mm -hmm. Okay, Are all apostles? Answer? No. No. Now, I have a question. Can someone be an apostle that claims to be one? Hello, did I lose everyone? (laughs) Yes, those are called false apostles. Okay, we we just read about that, didn't we? In 2 Peter chapter 2, there were false teachers and false prophets among the people. Okay? Uh, And the book of 2 Corinthians 11 warns about False apostles, okay? Uh, False teachers. Are all teachers the answer? No. Um, Are all prophets answer? No. Are all workers of miracle? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? (laughs) No. No. Do all interpret? Answer? No. No. It tells you in, in, the, in the first part of this book that all do not speak in tongues. And the church, is, um, the church is made up that way. So it is dependent on one another as members one of another. 
So the answer is no. So it tells you you have to speak in tongues to do this or be saved or do that or be in the church or be spiritual. It's a lie. It's not what the scriptures say. Okay, so that would be an example. Now, for our purposes, um, I don't know if I want to emphasize placement or not because you can get in a lot of trouble with that. But you notice that you know prophet, prophets are um, usually take a, a pretty prominent place in the early church. They had a very uh, important, well, paramount role in the church. Okay? Um, and their forthtelling was the gift used to inform the church of what it needed to know for edification and comfort. Okay? Um, instruction and doctrine came through prophecy in the New Testament. Look in Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 20. Ephesians 2.20. Uh, this is also a good passage to discredit the idea that the Old and New Testament prophet are somehow the same ministry. Okay, because we read in 1 Peter chapter 1 that when they wrote of the grace of God, they didn't know what they wrote and they searched diligently to understand it, correct? Okay, so here in Ephesians 2 verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner. Okay? So, obviously, that the Old Testament prophet and New Testament prophet are, are two entirely different ministries. All right. Um, the purpose of their ministry was to edify, to comfort, and encourage the believers. To edify, encourage, and comfort the the believers. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 3. 1 Corinthians, let's back up a minute to verse 1. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Follow after love and desire spiritual, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in a, a language speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth, however in the spirit he speaketh mysteries, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men edification, exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in a known language edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. The same problem Paul had back then we're having today. <laughs> Some things just don't change. Uh, all this emphasis on tongues is very interesting. It was also in the Corinth church. And there was an unbiblical uh, and a, a spiritual problem with the Corinth believers concerning that gift. <clears throat> Later on, Paul says, I'd rather speak five words, everybody that can understand, than 10,000 that no one could understand. How's that edify the church? So, Understand about, uh, about the prophet. But that was the key to uh, the prophet in the New Testament church. Um, while its effects upon unbelievers was to show that the secrets of man's heart are known to God and to convict sin and constrain to worship. Look in verse 24 and 25. 
24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 and 25. But if all prophecy, and there come in one that believeth not, or unlearned, he is convicted of all, he is judged of all, and thus all the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. That's the effect of prophecy. Can speaking in tongues do that? No. No. Uh, was uh, tongues a sign gift? Absolutely. Was it necessary in the early church? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can see what that gift was to do in the prior verses. You see. Um, look in verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other languages and other lips will I speak unto this people. Who's the this people? Isaiah, this is taken from Isaiah. It's the Jews. This people refers to the Jews, not the church. And yet for all that will they not Hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues, languages, are for a doctrine? No, they are a sign. They are a sign to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them who believe It's a sign. Um, I don't remember. I don't know if you remember my old story about signs, but uh, Pastor Brunk and I were uh, out, and uh, Pastor uh, Brunk uh, developing Katoris Bible Church in South Africa. Uh, he had come over with me a, a couple of years prior to his decision about going to Africa, and we had just come from some meeting somewhere. I can't remember now what it was, um, and he wanted to drive. And uh, driving in Swaziland, other side of the road, other side of the car. And it was a Saturday night, which kind of bothered me a little bit because Saturday nights over there can be a problem. And he said, okay, Ted, uh, what do I do? And I said, well, you're driving. So um, I said, follow the signs, Mike. Just, just follow the signs. And we kind of laughed about that because we both made a spiritual connotation out of it, you know. And um, so we're going down the, the road, and I looked down for a minute. I was organizing something, and the car was moving funny. And I thought, what's he doing? Well, this sign was moving on the road, and he was following the sign. Okay. Some fella became inebriated and took the sign off the post and was running around with the sign on the road. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of reminded me of people who are following after signs. Uh, you better be, be very careful because you find out in 2 Thessalonians that someone else can do signs too. Right? And that has spiritual connotations. And I said, that's what happens when signs are misused. <laughs> Um, we have people running around with signs, right? And they're not following the road. Uh, the sign is an indicator. It, it points to something. It points to something. Um, the idea, the sign is to help you to stay on the road and to follow the road to your destination. And so it is with the spiritual Gift, sign gifts. They are pointing towards something. And whenever you see these, these, this time of, of this, sign, or this sign gift used in Scripture, it is coming at a particular time when, th when God is pointing towards something. For example, in Acts 2, that gift is used. And men heard out of every country the language of that country, the wonderful works of God from those in Galilee. They knew that that was a sign. And they responded to Peter by saying what? What does this mean? They didn't worship 
the language is spoken. They knew it was a sign. They were devout Jews. They knew a sign when they saw one. They knew these Galileans weren't educationally and academically able to speak in all of these languages. They knew that. That was, that, as we call it in, uh, in our slang, a no-brainer. Okay, That could be easily figured out. So their question was, all right, what does this mean? They knew. There was a message coming. And Peter gave them that message. It was the message that now the administration of God is through his church. Okay? The resurrected, the one that was crucified is risen again. Okay. And whenever you see it, for example, in the book of Acts chapter 10, we have a movement. The door was then being opened to the Gentile. You see. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, we see yet another movement in that now the door uh, and, and the central location of the church would be Asia Minor, Ephesus. So is tongues important? Absolutely. Is it for today? No, we don't need that. That's not necessary today. That's been put away. Um, and uh, the, the Jew is being reached in every country with the gospel. So understand, um, when we're talking about prophecy and we're talking about these gifts, uh, that we don't make a religion out of the indi indicators. Okay? Uh, and we don't put interpretations there that are not scriptural, just as with prophecy. It's to be based on... On the scriptures. We saw that in 2 Peter chapter 1, didn't we? It's to be based on the scriptures. So when we look at these um, gifts, we need to be very careful uh, concerning that. Uh, another usage of the word, proceeding from the prophet or pro something that is prophetic. Uh, let's look in the book of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Very important that we appreciate both foretelling and foretelling, by the way. Very important that we, uh, that we don't despise it as, as, this, uh, as this exhortation, this emphatic gives, just because others misinterpret it and misuse it uh, we ought not to entirely do away with it. Uh, it, it. If you took prophecy out of the scriptures, where would we be? We got problems, don't we? And you can't. We're not going to do that. Uh, so look in the book of, of Romans, chapter sixteen, and in verse twenty-six. But now is made manifest. What's made manifest? This mystery of the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, that's, what this, that's the theme of this book. But now is made manifest, bare, brought to light by the scriptures, holy writ, of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all what? Nations. For what reason? For the obedience of faith. You see, the, the central theme, the central subject is not the prophet himself. Um, just as John tried to worship the angel, and the angel said, no, you don't worship me, worship God. You see, uh, the, the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of Jesus uh, is the basis of prophecy. Uh, the true prophet, the true servant, the true preacher, the true apostle is going to glorify Jesus Christ. Not himself. Not a movement. And that's so important that we understand it's the danger of denominationalism and movements. Uh, movements can end up being winds that toss us to and fro. 
this scripture won't toss you to and fro. This is God's voice. Uh, it's, um, it's His divine oracle. And we get prophecy that doesn't fit the word. It's out. It's out. Uh, it has nothing to do with us. It should not become our doctrine. Just because some guy behind a plastic pulpit on some network says something does not mean that that's true. Okay? And that's true of this Bible teacher. If I'm telling you something and it's not biblically based, it might be the right thing, but it's not God's truth. It has to be God's truth revealed according to the Scriptures and the theme is Jesus Christ, not men. Not by the will of men. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 21. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and we'll introduce the next thought. 5 verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Uh, but examine everything carefully. Uh, the, the interpretation of this idea of hold, of, of proving here, uh, the word means to examine all things or examine. The word is examine. Um, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. I believe these two verses really go together. Uh, they're very interesting. Uh, the first verse accentuates the what? The good. The second accentuates that which is evil. Uh, the contrast kind of brings them together. <laughs> You see, and I think all of these fall under the idea of, of following or pursuing that which is good. And from verse 15, uh, the emphatic start with it and end with it. And it's telling us what pursuing good means. So uh, the, the thoughts are grammatically placed together. Prove means to test. Um, and this not only applies to prophecies. Uh, let the prophets speak two or three and let them um, uh, others judge. It is the expectation of approving or examining. So the next time we get together, we'll continue concerning um, this uh, word in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Um, Mr. Cardwell, would you end us in prayer, please? We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your word. And we thank you for what was just taught to us. We thank you for salvation in Christ Jesus. We pray in his name.